Welcome to STEAM Powered, where I have conversations with women in STEAM to learn a little bit about what they do and who they are. I'm your host, Michelle Ong. My guest today is Dr. Marsha Tuft. Marsha is a mechanical, aerospace and materials engineer who has had a fascinating career with G-Aviation and now works to help kids succeed in STEM through outreach and a middle school fiction books about a young girl named Putney and her STEM adventures. Join us as we talk about Marsha's engineering journey, Putney's world and underwater hockey. Welcome to the Steam Powered, Marsha. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm looking forward to talking with you about your amazing engineering journey. Thanks so much, Michelle. I'm so excited to be here on your podcast. Thank you. So uh, we'll get started on where you began your STEAM journey. And, you know, I'm impressed because, you know, engineering has never been a thing that I've been particularly good with with maths and all that. But mechanical engineering, that's very cool. So what drew you to this area? Well, I loved math and science and physics um, and my parents um, were very much proactive in making sure my sister and I had solid math backgrounds. Uh, my dad was a non-degreed industrial engineer. He was a World War II veteran. He could have gone to school and gotten an aerospace engineering degree on the government, but he lacked confidence in his own math skills. So we actually sold a house that my parents had built and moved to a different wow. school district because my sister was getting substitute math teacher after substitute uh, when she was in high school. So we switched school districts. Yeah. That's how proactive my mom was about our education. So absolutely. Um, so she really emphasized the importance of math. And for the most part, I really enjoyed it. And I, I had great teachers, so I was pretty much interested in everything, but I loved art too. Um, and it was kind of between, I looked at architecture and then realized oh, I'd have to be a glorified draftsman for five years. And that didn't sound so exciting. Yeah. I thought, you know, I was, you know, yeah. growing up in the 60s and graduated high school in 77. So it's like I was expecting to someday be married and have kids. And so how long are you going to be mm. working? Uh, little did I know, yeah. I'd be working, you know, 35 years. And, <laughs> you know, so it's just, you know, life changed a lot from when I grew up to where we are today. Yes. And, um Fortunately, I, I liked a lot of things. Um, in junior high, we had this thing called a Gatby test, which kind of said, okay, here are the things that are, mm. you know, challenging for you that would be a really good fit. Here are the things that are too easy for you. And, you know, and here are the things that you're totally unskilled and unsuitable for. So manual dexterity, concert yeah. pianist, and surgeon were out. Um, but you know, science and engineering was up there and then like art was kind of in the middle and I thought, well, what would I do as an artist and would I be like a commercial artist and drawing what somebody else wanted? And I remembered all the art midterms that I get kind of bored paint working on my painting and stuff, but mm -hmm. it, I mean, I loved it, but you know, my parents were very practical about, okay, what are you going to be able to earn a living at? And and yeah. they really did kind of guide me toward mechanical engineering because it is a more technical degree than industrial. And so they kind of felt mm. like, you know, that was a really good kind of background. And then I did a, um, a week um, at Purdue University between junior and senior year. They had a, uh, an, you know, a week of summer engineer camp kind of thing. And you got a little bit of flavor for mechanical yeah. and chemical, and electrical. It's like, okay, I, I hadn't had physics yet. I'd had chemistry, but it's like, okay, chemical engineering. Mm, I don't think I want to learn how to crack, you know, carbons and, you know, make, you know, fuel. And stuff like that. <laughs> but, you know, you know, but I learned a little bit more about mechanical. And it's like, well, yeah, okay. That, I still didn't know a lot about it, but it kind of sounded okay. And, um, I did learn one of the things I got out of that um, summer camp was, okay, computers are everywhere. Maybe I need to sign up for a computer um, class. <laughs> so fortunately, yeah. mom had had me take typing so I could type my own term paper. So my keyboarding skills were really good. And I found, well, we were using paper decks of cards back then, you know, back in the 70s. 
Yes. And my programs, <laughs> so I learned great, um, great flow charting. And my programs usually mm -hmm. ran the first time around because I was good at typing. I didn't make typing mistakes. So that was, <laughs> I, I had a heads up there and, and I enjoyed coding and, and computer programming. And then I loved physics. So I yeah. had physics senior year. And so everything mm -hmm. was still kind of building to, well, I, you know, I kind of think, you know, mechanical engineering and um, mom really liked Purdue University and engineering was really big there. So, you know, and I loved the yeah. campus when I spent a week there. So everything seemed to be moving that way. And then, you know, you start and, you know, when you start, I mean, I didn't know a whole lot about mechanical engineering and it's still, you know, even in four years, you only scratch the surface of what you can do as a mechanical engineer because it's so much the yes. basics and engineering, whichever mm -hmm. branch you're in is all about problem solving, but you have to it learn um, specific disciplines. So you've got to learn in mechanical, you learn thermodynamics, you learn fluid mechanics, you learn um, something about machine design, mechanical design, um, strength of materials, a little bit about materials, control theory. So, you know, you kind of get a broad education that you can apply in a lot of different areas, but you really... Yeah, it's foundations. It, yeah, and it's like, and still there's so many more things that you can get into that you just scratch the <laughs> surface as an undergraduate. Yeah. Um, the one thing I did find out, um, okay, so university is really different from high school <laughs> because in high school, the yes. teachers actually know how to teach. When you get to university, <laughs> the professors only have to be technical content experts. And they're not necessarily yes. holding your hand about getting the homeworks and making sure you understand things. So it's like, you know, yeah, you do the homeworks, but um, you might be in a lecture hall with 150 to 300 other students and you might have some TA sessions um, with a TA that doesn't yeah. necessarily speak English as a first language. So, you know, and some, it's just a whole lot easier to not maintain the same level of, of, um, studying as you did in high school because it's a lot more structured and it's more built to help you succeed and at university they're also you know looking to weed out the the students that don't really belong and flunk out some people so sophomore year yeah. i had a very rude awakening um when i got my first d ever in physics electricity and magnetism <gasps> um the way the ta yeah. had graded one of my homeworks made me think that uh current was being created at one of the nodes of my circuit. So it's like, I really missed some fundamentals there. And my parents, oh were, my goodness. my parents were not happy with me. And I realized that, okay, I have to make a choice. I either have to figure out if I have what it takes to stick in engineering, or I have to figure out what to change to. And I didn't want to be a quitter, mm -hmm. but I didn't know if I had what it took to stay in engineering. Yeah. And, you know, I'd gotten awards on my high school physics project, but that was just one semester, you know, that was part of a year in high yeah. school. And when the rubber hit the road, it was really all the creative projects and things I'd done and created as a kid in elementary school, including sewing doll clothes and drawing architectural houses and doing floor plans and designing furniture with my dad and all these other things that I yeah. dreamed up, created, problem solved on my own. I figured, you know, and the art stuff too, but I knew I was creative. I just figured I had to learn a new medium. And I guess today yes. with the interpretation of, okay, what I was really learning back then is really problem solving skills and how to learn from failing, yes. learn by doing and figure things out. And mm -hmm. what I later learned at GE is I have phenomenal project management skills because of all those hobbies as, as a kid. And I was figuring out <laughs> industrial engineering yes. and sewing machine layout and how to have my tools handy and, you know, you know, this project didn't go the best. What what fabric would I choose next time? How would I lay out my work surface next time? So all those things kind of gave me grit and resilience um, that helped me mm. stay the course. Now, I still had to figure out that, okay, I can't go on doing the same thing I'm doing. And then I look back yeah. to say, okay, when was I really good at learning and and tough stuff? And I thought, well, biology, I would just study it until I knew that mm -hmm. I knew the material. 
And I realized that I had to stop studying to pass a test and pass what some professor mm -hmm. thought I should be answering on a test. I needed to hold myself accountable. And the very next semester. It's a big shift in methodology as well. Just the way that you would approach those two tasks are entirely different mm -hmm. because, you know, if you're solving a problem for someone else, you are going to be able to take shortcuts. You're going to be able to cut corners because you just need to meet that objective. Whereas if you're learning to make sure that you understand, you are going to fill in all the gaps that are missing yourself. And it's easy. I mean, you can fool somebody else sometimes, especially if it's multiple guests and you get a little bit lucky or you only have to eliminate, <laughs> yes. you only have to eliminate three answers to figure out the fourth one is correct. I mean, I once, yeah. so I, freshman year chemistry exam. Okay. So, um, calculators were relatively new. They weren't as reliable as they are now. And we still had slide rules and I had a chemistry test where my battery died on my calculator. And I had to just oh, no. figure out, you know, do the math in my head and figure out what the answers were. So, you know, it's like it, it, it forced a different level of how do I approach things and, and, you know, how to get, you know, but, you know, with multiple guests, it's like, okay, I, I know it's not this one. I, I know it's not that one. I, anyhow. So I, I got through it. And after yeah. that, I took two calculators and a slide rule to all the future tests. But, <laughs> but, um, but what I ended up doing, so back to the physics, the next semester, I had to take EE201, linear circuit analysis. Mm -hmm. And it was a 7.30 a.m. lecture with like, I don't know, 200 people or something in the lecture hall. And the tests were going to be multiple guests. And I thought, oh crap, this is going to set me up for failure. This, you know, I, it's not going to work for me. I'm, but they had an independent study section. So the first thing I did is I switched into independent study so that I took the test when I was ready. And it was actually kind of cool. They had, it sounds crazy, but they had um, audio tape recordings of the lectures that you could listen to nice and you could and yeah. there was like an independent study lab so if you had questions on homework problems or whatever there were um graduate students there that you could ask help from and you kind of mm -hmm. worked through the course at your own pace and when you were ready you took the test and they proctored the test now the challenge was still cool. finishing within a semester <laughs> and yes. i definitely finished maybe the last half of the course and maybe the last quarter of the semester, but I, I finished and I aced it and I really understood the material. And yeah. that set me up for the next three um, control theory classes in the mechanical engineering program because I had such a solid foundation. And the cool thing mm. about electrical engineering, the cool thing about engineering and math, so math is kind of the universal language yeah. for sciences. And, you know, like, you you've probably heard the term analog computer today it's all about digital computers but back when i was in college they still had analog computers and that what that really means is yes you can do the integration you can do integrals um uh, integration and differentiation using basically electrical circuits because a mass in a mechanical system is the equivalent of a capacitor in an electrical system resistors and dampers are analogs and then inductors and springs are analogs so you just have to figure out which value of capacitor resistor inductor corresponds to your mechanical system and you can solve you know complex differential equations quickly so anyhow so when you when you get all that and you realize okay all i have to learn is how to solve the system of differential equations and it works whether I'm in a mechanical system, a fluid system, you know, or electrical system, it's just so powerful. And, and so you've got all these other it ex is. extensions that you can apply and, and it just, it's really cool. I thought it was really cool. Well, it is <laughs> when you, when you learn something that, you know, just clicks everything into place and suddenly opens up all of this world of other knowledge that you can branch into, mm -hmm. that is very powerful. 
So, so anyway, so mechanical engineer, after that, my grades really started taking off. So I had straight A's the next semester. I, I wasn't a straight A student the rest of the way, but I was a very solid A, sometimes B student. And it just gave me so much more confidence mm -hmm. to realize, okay, I can take responsibility for my learning. I am smart enough. I don't maybe have all the hobbies that my male peers did. So, you know, it's like when you had your first design project and they've been tinkering on bikes, okay, I feel like I don't have, you know, I'm not <laughs> this quite the same experience, but I have a different and unique experience and I can still be successful. Yes. And I have some, I have a unique perspective to offer. So um, then uh, looking for a job. So I worked um, summers. Mom didn't want me to co-op. She wanted me to, I'm based in Cincinnati. Um, so she preferred to have me home in the summers. I ended up working summers at, uh, well, the first summer I did temporary clerical, um, Kelly Victor temporary services and ended up at P&G on my second assignment. When they found out I was an engineering student, they kept oh. me the rest of the summer. And then the next summer I was oh, nice. through a um, engineering contractor um, on a project that I kind of worked with one of the project engineers the summer before, and then they were implementing it at the Ivorydale soap plant. And then the third summer, I was a full-fledged uh, summer engineer through PNG, and PNG is a wonderful company nice. to work for. But it's very much a chemical company, so the mm. chemis were having all the fun in you know light-duty liquids. They could tinker <laughs> with all the chemical processes yeah. and optimize the you know all the you know the chemical um, transformations going on. And it's like, okay, as a mechanical engineering, I could maybe get into packaging or I could be <laughs> the first woman mechanical manager of the Ivorydale soap plant. And I was thinking, well, I like the project management and the manufacturing management side, but mm -hmm. I think I wanted something more mechanical. And I got to do some cool coding with Alan yeah. Bradley. Um, I, I got to work some cool cost reduction projects. So one of the cool things I got as one of my electives was engineering economics, which is understanding the time value yeah. of money. And that was- That's very cool as a unit. Yeah, I think, you know, it's like, I feel like it should have been a requirement because any project yeah. you work on, you gotta figure out, well, these can be million dollar projects, billion dollar, you know, you gotta know how yes. much your investment is worth or how much, you know, exactly. return on investment you need to make it worth putting the money into this project. So you got to understand sort of the, the business side a little bit. So exactly. That's very important. And, but one of the things I learned, um, is sometimes you, you could, um, save yourself a lot of work. If you get clear criteria on pass fail, like how much, how much of a cost savings does this need to be? Cause I, I was doing all this heat transfer analysis for, they wanted to yeah. change. So, PNG works with some really aggressive um, uh, chemicals, very corrosive, some of them in the soap making process. And they wanted to get out of yes. a water-based heat exchanger to an air-based heat exchanger that they could put on the roof of the yes. building and you know not have the worry about corrosion and the chemical seeping through into the water. Um, yeah. But when you have to consider that you know, Cincinnati gets to maybe 95, 100 degrees in the summer sometimes, and you've got to have margin to mm -hmm. be able to cool that down. That's like, um, if I really had clearer criteria, I could have saved myself a lot of detailed, you know, estimate. <laughs> I, I mean, I literally walked miles of pipes and estimated diameters and you know, <laughs> how much, you know, I figured out convective heat transfer coefficients. And I could have saved myself a lot of that time if I'd had clearer criteria, because it's like, Mm, no, this is not going to fly. Not not with having to yeah. do the cooling in the summer with those kinds of conditions. So, yeah. But so, all the thresholds, all the kind of mm -hmm. yeah, how much what was important and how much of it was important. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can get a really quick yeah. answer that's close enough, a lot faster, and it is like yes. you know you don't have to do all the dot the i's and cross the t's. Um, yeah. It doesn't have to be 100% optimized. Nope. Nope. If you've got, you know, okay. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we're never going to get to there. We could get maybe 
<laughs> so, but that was something good to learn. So, yeah. Um, the other thing I learned was okay, maybe I wanted a more mechanical product. And I thought, well, Alan Bradley, that was a cool, I worked with those and I interviewed with the, at Purdue with the, uh, the recruiter had a PhD in electrical engineering. And he kind of shook my hand yeah. as if I might have a contagious degree, disease or something. It's like, <laughs> yeah, we use mechanical <laughs> engineers to design some of our switches. You know, so it's like, okay, electrical based company, not a good fit. Chemical base. No. <laughs> yeah, if I want to do manufacturing management, sure. But if I really want to yeah. keep, you know, to some of the design skills and more main skill, I needed a more mechanical project. And guess what? GE Aircraft Engines, now called GE Aviation, is based in Cincinnati. Now, GE wanted to hire me for their manage <laughs> management program. Um, so I got an interview yeah. from them uh, from Purdue and then... Uh, I, from a local contact, I got an interview at GE um, Aircraft Engines. So I actually hired in on their engineering development program, which was absolutely fantastic because they have a program where you kind of, you have about two and a half to three years to kind of co-op where you're doing six to nine month engineering assignments and you have like three rotational assignments plus a field assignment. And you can do the advanced course in engineering and work on a master's that they pay for. So it's some implant courses. That's very, and very cool. University courses. So I, I got my master's degree in aerospace engineering at the University of Cincinnati. You know, GE footed yeah. the bill and I actually got two full-time quarters off. And at the That's same time, cool. I didn't get to choose my first assignment, but I had to choose the next two. So I got to see different areas of engineering and figure out what I liked and what I didn't like. And it's, it's stuff that you, you know, it's like controls at GE was really different than controls at, at Purdue. So we had hydromechanical controls and, you know, and it just totally, totally different. And just, you know, learning about the systems and, and the control logic for setting up an engine, starting it up, you know, shutting it down and, you know, marine and industrial versus, um, commercial aircraft where you could have a control system the size of a room for an m &I engine because it doesn't have to fly. So you've got, you yes. know, a whole different constraints than the stuff that's got to go on the engine that flies. Um, and then learning. That's such a good opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, my second assignment, I was jealous of all my um, colleagues that were doing, looked like really cool <laughs> um, finite element program. So they had you know, plots of all the parts that they were analyzing. And so my second um, assignment was in a advanced technology mechanical design group. And basically I was disappointed because the draftsman would change oh. the combustor arm and I would redigitize it. And the guys, you know, they didn't really understand the program. They couldn't tell me what the arrow codes meant. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, uh, well, I thought I was going to be able to do more design and optimization. And, and in that group, I didn't. Yeah. And, and it was a very young and fast crowd. And mm -hmm. I didn't feel real comfortable in that group. So it's, it's like I was learning my old group, m &I Controls and Accessory. You know, the youngest guy was like in his 35. The guy that was mentoring me was maybe 45. And there were a lot of guys in their late 50s and 60s. But it was a family and they were very inclusive. The third group I worked with was, again, a very young bunch of um, um, engineers, much younger, but very family oriented, um, very inclusive and yeah. just phenomenally, um, you know, just wonderful to work with that really cared about helping you learn. Um, making sure that you were part of the team, explaining things so you knew. I mean, I worked with um, Tony Murphy and Dan Mike, and it's like they were just phenomenal at explaining the life management process and how things, you know, how to predict the useful life of a part and what went into the stress analysis, the heat transfer and um, materials behavior and, you know, how you calculate 
um, and effective stress and how you go in the material curve and calculate the life and all the miners rule and all that. So it's like you weren't just turning a crank and cranking out a number. You were understanding they were actually how to pull this things, program yeah. to go and, and what why things broke and what you know what you had to understand and predict and I actually ended up going That's off great. program in one of the life management groups and got to do some really cool redesign analysis where we had a part that the fillet didn't have a high enough well my manager thought he would give me the easiest part in the whole engine and the hp turbine which was the hpt front shaft so it connected the compressor the cdp seal of the compressor to the stage one disc in the turbine. And it basically looked like a stovepipe with flanges, except it was the life limiting part <laughs> of the engine. And it was the four flange fillet that had the lowest life. So it's, you know, so <laughs> my manager explained to me how, you know, you could remove material and get the damaged material out and extend the life of the part through a rework. And I got to work with one of the chief engineers who explained how to contour that fillet. So you have multiple adjacent fillet radiuses to get you know, a nice contour and I got to do some cool finite element analysis and optimize it. And then it had to go into a bigger model so I could get all the right boundary conditions in and check it out. But, you know, so I got several awards. That's very cool. I got several awards from those redesign efforts and that, you know, whatever, nice. 25 years later, you know, so this was a CFM 56 engine I was working on. And years later when I eventually was working that in, um, <laughs> as the uh, team leader for CFM 56 life management. And then later as in the fleet modeling side of things, it's like my fillet designs are still there. They're, you know, they're predominantly through all the rest of the engines that have come through, you know, so it's like, okay, that's yes. standard practice now. And it's, they're still working and those engines that's are That's really good. gratifying. Yeah, it is. It's like, Hey, that work I did back then, all these new parts, they it's still valuable. Like that's great. <laughs> So the, the other thing I got to do at GE, so is one of the, okay, when I hired in, they were hiring, well, Purdue was graduating about 10% women. GE was hiring about 10% mm -hmm. women. Um, so once I graduated from um, the advanced course in engineering, got my master's in aerospace engineering, they invited me to be one of the adjunct supervisors for the advanced course. So that just meant I, you know, would, sit in on the classes and then I would review the homework problems. So the students, you have a couple graders and then the, the adjuncts, you know, review the grading. And, and, and so I was working with the students and we had, uh, eventually we had a student focus team and an advisory council we brought in. And when I was my, I guess in my early thirties, um, the manager of technical education job came up and I, I applied for it because I thought, you know, the homeworks haven't changed in years. They could be updated. Um, we've got some things identified with the student focus team that, you know, the instructors, the students would like to see better teaching. Um, you know, the homework problems, you know, maybe the content could be updated a bit. And I thought, okay, I, yeah. I could make a difference. And uh, I got the job. They, they, they were a little bit concerned that I had too much on my plate that I wanted to work on. And um, <laughs> there's another guy that's like, well, the, they'd have to light the fire under him. And they thought me, they might have to rain back a little bit. But um, <laughs> one of the first things I got to do was go through a, an instructor development workshop led by uh, Glenn Markle and Ted Fowler from UC's Teacher College. And it's like the light bulb went off. It's like, yes, if I'd only known this when I was going to Purdue, it's like, yes, professors don't know how to teach. And we can fix a lot of the yeah. problems we were seeing with the advanced course is just a lack of effective instructional methods. And then what I found out when I was selling yeah. this to department managers and the instructors is like, the instructors were equally frustrated with the students because they felt like they were being disrespectful. They weren't listening, you know, so it was like, a lack of engagement because it's a communication issue yeah yeah because they didn't have some of the skills and the tools that you know people who actually go to school to learn to teach learn so yeah. you know lecture dump doesn't do a whole lot for getting good engagement and no, and it's all very one way you can cram a lot of material in but you 
the students can't do the information processing to really own it. And, and what yeah. I've learned from that is you're actually a lot more effective if you just are more selective in what you teach and then get the information processing. Mm. So, yes. So anyhow, so I, I had three very fun, <laughs> challenging years um, working on instructor development, curriculum development efforts, worked with corporate to got to the point where, okay, I, I have to make a decision to go back to engineering or, you know, to stay in tech, you know, you stay out of engineering too long and it's hard to get back in. Um, yeah. So the choice I, what happened was I rediscovered my joy of learning and I went back and worked on a PhD. Mm. So I went back to my old department and negotiated that I was going to work on my PhD. There were some really interesting materials problems. Um, and, my, yeah. and I had the mechanical aerospace side. So I, I had the structures, the stress analysis piece, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't have all the materials engineering background. And if you know anything yeah. about um, aircraft engines, um, it's a lot about fuel efficiency and specific fuel consumptions. Mm. So you want, you want more thrust yes. and you want more efficient um, specific fuel consumption. That means higher um, cycle temperatures, which means more advanced materials, which means Yes. You're pushing the envelope so that there's an old joke. The first thing you learn about a new material is the best thing you'll ever learn about the new material. And then you get to see all the downside. So, you know, they're adding all these alloy, <laughs> they add all these alloy elements to get yep. this higher temperature capability. And then when you do the testing, it's like now it behaves a little bit differently. Now there's some new failure modes yes. that we didn't have to account for before. And we had this material. Renee 88DT, and we have the surface treatment process. Okay, so I mentioned that I worked in life management for several years, for about 22, I guess, of my 35. Um, and we have the surface treatment called shot peening, which is you, you basically shoot tiny little metal balls at a part, and it induces a mm -hmm. residual compressive stress on the surface. So if you think of a residual um, stress it's like you have, um, so if you're going to pull something in tension, if I had a crack here, so I've got a little crack here, yes. and it's in tension, I can rip this piece of paper. However, I can have this little crack here. If I have a compressive stress, so let's say my fingers are holding things together, I, I can't tear this apart because I've got some compression that's keeping that crack closed. So that whole part about shot painting is... It's, it gives us additional margin for our parts. So if you've got a, a machining mismatch or something, it gives us a little bit of benefit to um, reduce a crack initiation event. And Renee 88DT wasn't behaving mm -hmm. like plain vanilla Inconel 718. So, you know, it's like we were actually over painting. It seemed like, you know, there were some conditions when it would have great life and other conditions where you know, we peen this in Inconel and it's fine. And now it's, it's failing faster in Renee 80 DT. So anyway, so that ended up being what I selected for my dissertation topic. And I, you know, I actually came up with Ooh. the uh, fracture mechanics threshold behavior model where I could kind of predict. And, and I got to do single particle impact tests. So I, you know, so I was basically charting my PhD through the University of Dayton and picking such, and I did materials engineering, but I had courses through, you know, the mechanical department. There's, I mean, UD was cool because it had this research institute. So they've got, mm -hmm. um, Wright Patterson has PhDs out there and some classes were taught out there. They had um, impact dynamics lab. So, and I actually even got to do high temperature, um, uh, transient temperature measurements. So I shot, I figured out how to shoot individual particles of basically flea dirt sized metal at a target, measure the velocity and get the transient thermal response and figure it's like, okay, you know, vibration is heat and, you know, you hit this particle at a 
at a threshold velocity and you get some local melting. It looks like melting on the surface. That's because you've heated the surface up locally and I can prove that. So, so I, <laughs> so I learned a lot and I, I was able to figure out, you know, okay, once you get beyond a certain um, strain rate, which is kind of velocity divided by radius, um, it's not like Hertzian quasi-static behavior anymore. You're in a higher um, strain rate regime and the material is behaving differently. So R88 actually was kind of acting like it was pre-cracked. And if the residual stress layer wasn't deep enough, you know, it acted like a crack. So I, I figured out that, yeah. yeah, there was a certain velocity threshold if we kept that below. And so then that translated into shot size and intensity. And, you know, so we could figure out gentle, robust peening conditions and here's the more aggressive peening conditions that we need to avoid for these materials. So it, it was yeah. a lot of fun. It's like at the end of the year, I'd get to see whatever money other people hadn't spent yet. And then I get to write, um, write checks to UD and, and do some additional testing. So it was, if you ever do a PhD, <laughs> it can be the most fun you'll ever have. <laughs> That's cool. And yeah, the fact that you were able to focus like a lot of people when they go into phds well before they you know i've, I've been told that you have to choose from a pre-existing topic or something that somebody else has started working on but you know these days you do get the flexibility of being able to pick your projects so the fact that you were able to work on something that was so completely applicable to your work and to you know what you do for a living that's that's amazing well, I was really, really lucky because um, because I was working at GE and I was able to figure out a work-related dissertation. Uh, and actually my manager at the time had actually gone through the advanced courses, done his master's in aerospace and did his PhD, but at UC in materials engineering. So he had done a very similar thing. The biggest challenge I had to navigate was the, um, proprietary information. So I had to get my dissertation advisors ah, to sign right. a proprietary information agreement. And then I had to work with GE and my mentors at GE to figure out, you know, how to make the, the, make sure that I could actually publish my research. So we, we had to figure out, well, mm. I couldn't give stress and temperature and life because that was kind of priority, yes. but I could say, well, it was a stress and a temperature to give 100,000 cycles of life. So I, I had to be careful about how I presented the data. So it, it all had to go through legal review. And, you know, I, I had several department managers that had to review the content, make sure it was okay for release. And, you know, and my, yes. my professors were able to see the raw data because they signed the non-disclosure agreement. And, yep. You know, and eventually I was able to publish enough that it, they could say, yeah, you've earned your dissertation, but it, it was work related, which was very helpful. So that, you know, I was doing the coursework on my own time. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I, we were supposed to have like a third semester we could do. And I tried to use that instead of classwork. I, I asked for that hours to work toward my dissertation. So, you know, my management was really, really wonderful. So it worked out beautifully. Yeah. And such an interesting set of problems to have to overcome because of the proprietary nature of the work. That's yeah. Logistically very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, obviously, you know, with 35 years at GE Aviation, I mean, in this day and age, the cultural shift in the way we work and the way we approach work is so different. You, you can't really imagine anyone staying that long at a company. So you've, you know, you've already touched on all the amazing things about working for G, but what kept you there all that time instead of, you know, pursuing any other work opportunities or other kinds of avenues of research? Well, as you may have noticed, I, I, I tend to <laughs> like to dig into problems. Um, and I would say I'm not a big risk taker. So it's like, okay, I've had, you know, mm. I've had a program assignment where I, you know, I know that wasn't a good fit for me and this was a good fit. One of the things yeah. I loved about GE, I got into a group 
where the management was really proactive in wanting to develop their people. And GE had a great system, still has a great system, where you can bid on jobs. Mm. So if a job opening comes up, you're kind of in control of your destiny. So you can choose, do I want to go over in this direction? Do I want to try um, systems engineering? Do I want to try preliminary design? You can apply for those jobs so you're not just stuck someplace. Um, yeah, I made some strategic choices about um, I saw some of my friends in design that were, you know, and this was mm-hmm. in, let's say, the early 80s, where if design had a problem, it was mandatory overtime. And it, you know, it'd be like Tuesday nights and Thursday nights, you'd work four hours of overtime. And in life management, they split us from design because the life extensions weren't getting done when it was held by design because there was always a hotter fire to put out. So they had to develop a different group to handle the long term. Um, life extension process to meet the needs of the customers. Yeah. And I appreciate it not, you know, not being on the firing line that I could have a little bit more control over my life and my quality of life. And there were just some really cool people. So I felt like I ended up in a great place. I enjoyed the work. I felt like I was, I was earning good money. I had some great benefits. I loved the people I worked with. So you know, I, mm. I know GE's is not everybody has the same experience. Um, I would say one thing I learned from my parents was I was very proactive at figuring out what I liked. And, and also I didn't expect people to change themselves to suit me. And I, I had a few program. I had one program engineer work for me in particular. Well, I, so I had to, I had the the dream program engineer of all time that you could explain something to her and she'd come back um, 10 minutes later if she didn't understand something, ask their fine questions and she just did a phenomenal job. And then I had the other person that never asked a question and got really upset with me if I critiqued her results and pointed out what was wrong. It's like, yeah. well, so-and-so uh, substitute young male engineer gets along fine with me. You seem to have a problem with me. I don't, you know, it, it's you're the problem. It's not me. And it's like, yeah, so and so young male engineer is not responsible for checking your work. So it was, you know, it's it, it's not a personal thing. It's a professional thing. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's different. like, I think in that case, I mean, it was really a rough program assignment for me to to mentor mm. because I felt like I can't give her a positive performance appraisal and um, based on what I'm seeing and I need to give her some honest feedback and give her a, an opportunity to get her act turned around. You know, it was not easy, um, but she made significant improvement through the assignment and I was able to write, you know, a much more positive appraisal at the time. And then the program manager for the engineering development program contacted me afterwards and said, this isn't a glowing enough report. Um, and I said, she's made significant improvement, but the manager was expecting that she needed to do a one eight. They were going to be close to firing her, but they had a change in manager. And none of the male managers before her were willing to give her the feedback she needed in order to change and improve. So it's like, you know, it's like, yeah engineers are not always good at giving honest feedback you know engineers get promoted to management for doing what they did well which was solve technical problems not necessarily give constructive hard feedback you know it's easy to say oh yeah this is you're doing great at this and ignore the stuff that's not so great so it's a different set of skill sets that you need as well management like it you don't need to be technical to be a manager, but you do need to know how to manage. It's the same thing with the teaching, right? Yeah, but <laughs> unfortunately, when you have a very technical project, a t- technical product, yeah, you, um, it's like the management stuff they figured they can teach you, and but you're not going to cut yeah. it if you don't understand the technical stuff. So, and they promote it's the Peter principle. Yeah. I never understood the Peter principle until I came to GE. <laughs> it's like they promote you for what you did well which is the technical skills, but you get up into the management side and okay, you, not everybody is good at delegating. And, you know, so you have some managers yes. that they love the technical stuff so much they got to micromanage. 
And so they treat everybody like a co-op. Yes. So, you know, and one, one of the things I think I recognized was I like the technical stuff. So I actively yeah. chose not to go into the management path. So I felt like I, I'm, yeah. I'm basically a lot more of an introvert. I, I like working with teams and working with people, but I, I need my um, alone time out of meetings to dig into, in, dig into a meaty problem. So death to me would be sitting in eight hours of meetings or 12 hours of meetings a day. So. <laughs> Yes. But I felt like I was able to choose my path at GE. And there was, you know, at times when I needed a change, it's like I could take the initiative mm -hmm. on that. So GE was really good to me and I loved the people I worked with. And I just didn't see anything grass is greener out there to make me want to change. But um, GE does, uh, is cyclical. The aircraft engine business is cyclical. And we do have layoffs yes. roughly every 10 years or so. And that was the second motivation for doing a PhD because I figured, well, the 1990 layoffs, uh, when I was um, in technical education programs, they basically mm -hmm. laid off almost everybody under 35. And it was in three very painful oh, wow. rounds. It, that's how rough it was. And yeah. Um, the people who got let go first had the easiest time and then it got to be some people saw the writing on the wall and left and, and then it really hurt them later so they mm. never did that again but at that time i yeah. was thinking well they were also cutting out middle layer management so you know they were trying mm. to delayer and make the teams so ma managers instead of having four people would have 10 people you know so they were taking out middle layer of management so i thought I do not want to be a middle layer manager because you're too far away from the technical stuff to go back to that day by day. Mm -hmm. And how transferable are those skills to another industry? So I thought, well, I wanted to learn more and the PhD I figured would give me an opportunity. You know, if I wanted to teach at a university or something, it was a good credential to have. So yes. So that was my parachute. Gave, if you an exit strategy, if you needed yeah. it. And it, and it opened doors yeah. for me that just let me do some cool stuff. So, but as I said, Definitely. I was very lucky in my time at GE and um, yeah, got to do some really cool stuff. It is very cool. And one of the other great things yeah. about GE, especially um, my last few years there, and I've been doing it since retiring, uh, GE is really big about volunteering and community engagement. And they've always yes. partnered with different local schools, um, supporting STEM initiatives. And just recently, um, I be became aware of a partnership with Girl Scouts of Western Ohio, and they have an after-school mm -hmm. STEM program where you have like six weeks of once a week experiments. Mm -hmm. And we would have a team of, you know, like four to five GE volunteers per school that would go in and lead an experiment. That's cool. And I got, I actually um, got to go to Woodlawn Elementary and my, my, well, my dad didn't go to that nice. school, but he, um, he grew up in Woodlawn. So I felt a real connection to that area. And you got to work with the same group of like 10 girls over six weeks. And it was just so cool to see their excitement yeah. and lead different experiments for them. And that was, so my first engagement with that was 2015. And then in 2016, mm -hmm. that summer, they started a STEM summer camp. So each year I would, you nice. know, 2016 through 2019, I was developing a, an experiment and leading it for STEM summer camp. And then 2020, they went virtual cool. and I was, I'd already started my website and um, was working on writing the fiction books um, to support STEM. So I, I ended up volunteering to lead five of the experiments because, you know, GE was planning to do that's wonderful. They were planning to do their normal, it's normally three weeks and it's a different mm -hmm. group each week and we have five days of experiments. So I, I used to do the Thursday experiment yeah. and something mechanical related. And then we'd have a chemistry experiment, um, microscope experiment. Just a little bit of everything yeah, to give them a taste. Catapults on Friday. Yeah. So we, 
you know, but then it's like, okay, so they, and they were doing supplies. So they're used to doing, we kit the supplies and we have everything ready. Um, and we lead this, the kids through it. And then they had to switch to virtual. They were basically asked when COVID hit to switch to virtual and they wanted eight weeks mm -hmm. of content and it actually turned out to be nine. Yep. So it's like, okay, I've got <laughs> my cardboard catapult. I've got, um, cardboard boat race, um, buoyancy. I've got egg drop and, um, butterfly flight. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's like I, and we made the build the cardboard catapult and test the cardboard catapult. We split into two. So I came up with five weeks of That's experiments cool. and, um, you yeah. don't have as much feedback. It's not as much fun as doing it in person. And when you can really, of course, you don't, you don't get that and, enthusiasm and the, yeah, you no, know, it's like you, you put it out there and it goes out and, and maybe you get a photo of a girl doing an experiment. But even, even when you do it live, it's like, they're not chatting live with you. They're too shy to put the text in a lot of times they're yeah. watching it later, but, but we all got through COVID yes. and we got to be, it's a different environment. we got to be live again this year. Oh, that's cool. Outside That's with very, masks, very cool. but yep, we, we managed to do um, summer camp again this year. That's brilliant. Yeah. So what, like, obviously, you know, the outreach is, you know, just a natural progression from all the stuff that you were doing through GE, but what prompted the move to write middle grades, uh, you know, middle school books? Well, so when I um, was retiring and I realized that I, you know, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I felt like, okay, I really am excited about this engagement with girls. And I felt so grateful. Mm. As I told you, the D, I went from a D in physics to a PhD in engineering. And the thing that enabled yes. me to do that was all the hobbies and things that I did as a kid. And I felt like I really mm. wanted to help girls develop their self-confidence and their grit and, you know, see the fun side of STEM, you know, the science, technology, engineering, math. And, yes. and so I reached out to Ted Fowler, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> he's, he's still active and, you know, he's retired teacher emeritus. And I reached out, I tried to reach out to him and Glenn and Ted responded back Glenn had moved on, but Ted's still engaged with UC teachers college. But now he gets the projects that he wants to do. And he got me connected with the Greater Cincinnati STEM Collaborative. So the first year that I was retired, nice. I started going to their meetings and I got to attend a really cool conference that was hosted at, at uh, UC, um, the Next Lives Here conference and learn a whole lot about yeah. the challenges in STEM. And, uh, yes. and so some of the things that I was learning are, you know, okay, so a lot of the kids you know, even at our local Walnut Hills High School, which is a college prep high school, and I figure most of those kids are going to be going into STEM fields and they, they tried to start the discussion off with the softball question. It's like, so do you see yourself in a STEM field? And not one of the kids said yes. They all said no. And it's like, what? And it was like, why? And it's like, they lacked confidence in their math skills. So, you know, it's like, okay, so my parents were proactive, but you know, kids aren't, I mean, as a math teacher, I can understand if you don't see how engineers use math, how incredibly relevant it is. Like I've got equations that I can take a plastic knife here and I can predict the bending on this. If I turn it flat side here and put a finger down, you see how flexible it is. Mm. All I have to do is turn on the end and it's, it won't deflect. Well, simple algebra, I could calculate that and predict what the deflection is. So, you know, mm -hmm. I call them math recipes, there's formula, I mean, but there's so much you can do with math to design and optimize. Um, kids may think of, okay, build a boat, you build a physical model, but you can do a math model to size the boat and figure out how much weight <laughs> it can carry with, I mean, engineering is all about yes. optimizing and modeling and doing as much as you can efficiently. And math is a huge part of that. And one of the yeah. things I learned from the technical education background is how important motivation is to learning. So that if kids are motivated, they're more likely to be successful. 
and success builds motivation. And there's two dimensions of motivation, perceived relevance. So is there a use for this funky math that I'm doing? Um, how in the yeah. world I'm going to use it? And a lot of, a lot of parents are like, oh, you're never going to use algebra. You don't need that. Okay. So it's changing attitudes. Um, and it then is. believing that you can be successful. So setting them up for success. So some of these things that I learned, it's like, okay, if I could just show them the relevance, I can help them see the point of learning algebra and sticking it out and getting good at it and how cool it is, all the things you can do with it. Um, and the other thing I realized, um, so I had kind of an interest in writing and the thing is, um, stories change attitudes. And so when I looked at, okay, we got a problem with kids not seeing the relevance of math and maybe girls not seeing that they can do engineering. Um, so I was seeing a few challenges. I thought, well, what I'd really like to do is change attitudes and get them in like middle school before they get so overscheduled in junior high and high school. For me, I felt like mm -hmm. those were golden years in my life because my mom didn't work. I had summers free. I wasn't in scheduled activities from, you know, nine at, in the morning to nine at night. I could dream up my own projects and hobbies and do what I wanted to do. And for me, yeah. you know, problem solving skills are so incredibly important, but they're hard to teach because the learner has to be mm. in control. So when you start with a hobby, you've got motivation built in. Okay, because somebody's not forcing you to do it, you're choosing to do it. And you get to do it at your own pace. So you get to figure out what works, what doesn't. If you fail, it's okay. Um, art yeah. is a really wonderful because, you know, you generally aren't judged as much in art as, you know, math and science, there's a right answer, there's a wrong answer. When you get into college, yeah. it's like, Oh, there's many answers. Optimization is one of your challenges. But but yes. in grade school, you know, math and science, there tend to be right and wrong answers. So art, you get to get creative yeah. and you get to explore outside your comfort zone. And you're allowed to get wrong. Yes. Because there's no wrong. Right. And that's the thing yeah. I loved about art is you could explore and you could try different things and you didn't have, you weren't working to one solution. So, mm -hmm. and in engineering, you're not working to one solution. I mean, you've got a problem, you've got an objective, you've got constraints, but how you get to a solution, um, rapid prototyping is a really cool thing where, you know, you yes. just get, if you work to a minimum viable product. And in my first book, I actually, I have a sit upon design challenge that the, my protagonist works through and it ends up to be a big competition between her and the you know, her arch rival, um, where she's figuring out, okay, what do you really need in sit upon? It's like, well, water resistant and maybe some padding. She goes from, and, and okay. So the book, there's a, a magic iPad character who's a magic mentor and helps guide her through this mm -hmm. rapid prototyping. So she starts with an Ikea bag and, you know, so she's figuring out what size and then she figures out, well, maybe bubble wrap work. So she's just pulling stuff from her great aunt's house. She tries bubble wrap, she tries plopping down on it. It doesn't pop. So it's like, oh, this will work for padding. And, you know, a few layers. And then she's figuring out what size. And then her first attempt is, well, this would be comfortable to sit on. But man, this is a little 12 year old girl. And this thing is like 24 by 20. It's huge. It's <laughs> like, okay, well, you know, how much padding do I really need? Can I just do a tarp on concrete? It's like, mm, for grass, yeah, just a tarp. I don't need the padding. I can fold it up. But, okay, so what if I have a smaller tote that's just, you know, big enough to hold my sketch pad and big enough to put my bottom on, um, but I, then I can have a tarp for, you know, spreading, spreading out my art supplies and sitting on, you know, so she comes up with a different idea than she would have had if she just thought of traditional, what is a sit upon and how do I make a sit upon from what I have at home? And then, then she gets into, she sees what Sue's doing and then she tries something else. So then she doesn't want to take the tarp. So she makes a folding sit upon and then it's a little bit, you know, it's kind of cool, but still not big enough. So then she makes the, the 
the full tart out of a good new green grape um, plat material. And then it's a little bit heavier. It's a little over a pound. So then she's like, I'd really like it lighter. And if I'm going to have the tarp anyway, I don't need the folding sit upon. So she goes back to the stuff. So it's like, you know, <laughs> she over designs and then she comes back to an optimum solution. It's all about the critical thinking and the problem solving yeah. skills and just learning about how to be resourceful with what you've got available and, and trying to optimize what you've and got. The more constraints you have, the more creative you get. So it's like, you don't need to throw a lot of money yes. at a problem. You just have to think creatively mm. and um, critically about what are the key characteristics. Don't start with the definition that is, you know, if a, a company that made carriages for horses saw themselves as carriages, they would have a hard time getting into the car industry because they see themselves as, you know, the horse is the propulsion system. If you see it as a... It must be a horse. It must be. Yeah. If you see it as a transportation system, now, okay, the engine, the, the propulsion may be different. The passenger compartment may be what you're focusing on or, you know, so you just, you broaden mm -hmm. your product definition. You bring more options and solutions into your design space. And you can do some really cool things that way. Absolutely. Definitely. And uh, you just, you know, get to be more creative about a solution for which you'd think might be a bit more technical to begin with. And, you know, it's, yeah, just allowing yourself to explore those options. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's very, very cool. Okay. So we might start on some of those soft questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what hobby or interest do you have that's most unrelated to your field of work? Uh, let's see, lots of hobbies. And so everything from... I can imagine you have a few. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you can see the quilt in the background, that's... Um, I, I've been yes. quilting since uh, uh, 93, which is when I did my PhD, when I started my PhD. I was raising monarch butterflies. Wow. So we collected butterflies as a kid. <gasps> as an adult, I am a butterfly gardener. So I plant the laurel plant foods and nectar sources to attract a variety of butterflies. Monarchs, zebra swallowtails, um, spice bush swallowtails. I'm not so good at attracting tiger swallowtails. Um, I've gotten a few giant swallowtails. Um, and I was raising about eight monarchs and I got to watch them. Oh, wow. I got to watch and photograph two of them pupate. So go from caterpillar to chrysalis. And that's when it really hit me. It's like, oh, it's, it's a naked chrysalis. They just split the skin behind them. They hang in this J position and they kick the skin off. And hey, monarchs are not so shy as black swallowtails are. Um, so they actually go translucent. The chrysalis goes translucent the day before they emerge. Oh, and you can see the forewing that's very of cool. the butterfly through the chrysalis. Okay, geek engineer, I measured it. It was like about three feet <laughs> of an inch or whatever. And then I measured the forewing after the butterfly emerged. So I got to see out of the eight monarchs, I think I got to see most of them emerge. I got to photograph mm. a lot of them. And, you know, they go from this tiny little, you know, chrysalis to, you know, a butterfly with more of a three inch wingspan, you know, so it's the four wing yeah. expands by like 300% in under five minutes That's and they're incredible. flight ready in one to three hours. Okay. So I'm taking materials engineering and now I'm seeing this through the eyes of an engineer <laughs> and that sounds like a pretty phenomenal material spec. And I actually did a graduate I know. paper. That's very efficient. <laughs> I did a graduate paper. So I was taking material selection uh, from the head of department who was on my um, advisory committee. And we had to do a couple papers. And yeah. I asked him, could I do material selection for a butterfly wing design? And he said, well, Marsha, you know, it's not really very economical to design replacement <laughs> butterfly wings. And, and I explained what I wanted to do. It's like, I just want to understand what materials those are and how they can do this. And he was pretty impressed by my description of, oh, it's it, it the, the wings harden in like under an hour. It's like the rapid polymerization process. That's really fast. Um, and he pointed me in the direction yes. of, well, there have been um, engineers and scientists who have researched insect flight and, you know, bumblebees shouldn't be able to fly. And so I got into the aerodynamics and <laughs> all kinds of stuff through that. And then I later figured through my quilting and marbling, I did some marbling of fabrics and I realized 
okay, I'm laying color on a medium, on um, a marbling size, and then I'm dragging, you know, like a fork or, you know, these different styluses through that's moving mm -hmm. the dye on the fabric. I can do a marbling bath. I can basically do a wind tunnel. I can do a 2D wind tunnel and take a print of it. So, and actually in my third book, <laughs> The Butterfly Detective, um, I have Putney uh, figure out how to fix her butterfly stroke by watching get, watching butterflies and getting, you know, figuring out a little bit of that, but also figuring out that aerodynamics is related to fluid dynamics. So it's like a hummingbird mm -hmm. flying when he's doing this, he's hovering. So his arms are moving yeah. in figure eight. His motion for hovering is the exact same motion that I make when I'm swimming and sculling, treading water. Yeah. So it's like, okay, now I understand flight because I can relate it to swimming and that's something I do. So, and therefore that's I came cool. up with the marbling bath idea and I've done that experiment a few times for, I did it at my nephew's elementary school and, uh, that was one of my That's virtual pretty cool. experiments last year. So it's like, okay, so I can take a print of a flow path around a butterfly's flap and fling. And then I can see the spirals that mean high pressure. I can see how those um, spirals in the flow path, which actually means turbulence. And on an airfoil, it's a bad thing because mm -hmm. it's loss of lift. Loss of lift means yeah. that you don't have anything keeping the airplane up in the air. And therefore it feels like you're falling because you are falling. So turbulence when you feel yeah, like you're falling. Yeah, that is very, very cool. Yeah. So, so the butterfly and the quilting, um, and I do, I do some watercolor painting and acrylic painting, but probably, um, uh, and I've played underwater hockey and um, snorkeling. And nice. underwater photography. So I got into underwater photography so that I could take pictures of underwater hockey and explain it to people who had no clue about what underwater hockey was all about. But since you're from Australia, you know probably all about underwater hockey, or at least it's popular over there. I don't. <gasps> it is? It is. I didn't it know. Is. Tell me about underwater okay. hockey. <laughs> so there's about a three pound lead puck um, that sits at the bottom of the pool and you have about a one foot long wood stick it's got like a beveled edge and you have a protective glove on your hand because bottoms of swimming pools can be rough. Mm -hmm. uh, you wear uh, water polo caps to protect your ears. So, and the sticks are black or white. So you tell the team by your water polo cap color and your stick color. Six people, both ends of the pool, preferably minimum of six feet deep. Um, 10 feet's really good. You start the two ends of the pool, you swim out, dive down the puck um, and then you try to push it into the opponent team's goal which is about uh, 10 feet long so it's a, a metal trough that's cool and so it's very much a team sport because um, you really yeah. can't defend a puck and push it well you might be able to swim <laughs> you learn how to swim a couple laps underwater but you can't yes. defend against that and 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 play so <laughs> the air is at the surface that's so cool. You blow out your snorkel when you come up for air and you can watch the play development, but then you have to go down and support. You. So you learn teamwork and you right. may have three forwards, three backs, and you can sub out on the fly, but you have to go back to your side of the pool to sub out. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a really fun. That's very it's cool. It's a really fun sport, uh, very good physical exercise and kind of stuff. So for me, it was, yeah. I, I like um, exercise that's a little bit more social. So, um, Yoga, um, I like going to yoga classes and it, with COVID it's been, it's been virtual and our studio has been great with that. But um, mm -hmm. underwater hockey was one of my favorite sports for a long time until I got a little bit too old to um, That's cool. play with the high school kids I was playing with. It was like, okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm, um, yeah, it was, you know, there were a few of us GE engineers and, you know, a local high school that um, was big into underwater hockey, but. It's uh, quite a cool family. That's very cool. And my books have underwater yeah. hockey in it. So it's like the, the nice. real 3D version. Instead of J.K. Rowling's Quidditch, I have, you know, 3D underwater hockey. <laughs> so it is a game in 3D. That dimensions. is very, very cool. But um, Nice. And I, I kind of like to say I my hobbies are solving problems with fabric. So I still sew, but I make different things. I made, okay, so at... Um, <laughs> at GE, so 
sometimes budgets would get cut at the end of the year. And when I was working preliminary design, we had our Christmas party in February and we were trying to come up with a fun team building event. And we were looking at different mm -hmm. options and there was a trampoline park. And it's like, I started looking at team building. I remembered this fun ropes course that um, a bunch of us had done um, decades ago. And the current team building thing I was seeing was, you know, build a boat kind of thing. And I thought, okay, we just moved. We had all these cardboard packing boxes. I figured cardboard, duct tape, <laughs> plastic tablecloths, and a swimming pool. And I checked with the GE Fitness Center and somebody had already inquired about, you know, using the pool for something like that. So I got approval from the fitness center to use the <laughs> pool at no cost. I got approval from management for like four hours of time on a Friday afternoon for the party. And, you know, so all I had to do is get <laughs> box cutters, duct tape and tablecloths. So it was a really cheap and, you know, engineers designing a cardboard boat and then racing it. I mean, we just, I know, I was gonna, we had a I was going to say that the competition, my goodness. <laughs> so we figured, I figured about, and I did a dummy, a test scale to see if it would work. And, um, and I did, I did the math to do the buoyancy of the wire displacement. So I gave them a table so they could kind of figure out how much they needed, <laughs> water they needed to displace. And then there were a couple of the young engineers in our group were talking about battle boats. And I started thinking, okay, battle boats. Um, okay, if they're splashing a lot of water, what kind of design can I do so that, you know, we don't sink? And I came up with the surf boat yep. concept and I was, and we did, we drew for um, team survivor style. So I made these bandanas. So we had three different colors of bandanas and had a little logo on it. And um, I persuaded my team to try the surf boat idea. And uh, we were unsinkable. We won every race, you know, Rob didn't see how we were going to pass. Like, so I volunteered to go first. So we had water jugs that you could cut the bottom off. So I was doing the butterfly stroke with these water jugs. And I mean, it was just everybody had a blast. And yeah, eventually the other boat sank. And we That's got awesome. three people on our surf boat. And um, eventually they were able to torpedo us from underneath. But um, Mike and Dan were able to actually stand up and surf on it in the pool. You know, well, they stand it up. That's amazing. And then, then I got so obsessed with it. That I made a version to take my dogs on um, on one for the ocean, and then that was over design. I had to make a beach cart to carry it, <laughs> and then I came up with a low weight option using uh, one inch thick insulation foam board. I made like four layers, so I made you know like two foot wide by four foot long, and then did a marine grade fabric shell uh, zipper enclosure. So and super low tech waterproofing, just a couple garbage bags, duct tape. And then I could put um, D rings around the side and a zipper opening. So then I could thread cord through it so I could pull my dogs in the ocean. So I've got lots of cool pictures. And actually, <laughs> you can check on my website and there's a picture of Harry surfing on that. And yeah, and that's, that's hilarious. In, that's awesome. That's in books two and three, too. So um, nice. Right. And you're incorporating all of the stuff that you're working on into the books, which is amazing. That's also fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my fourth book I'm working Very on right cool. now is going to have a sea turtle theme. So I've been working with um, sea turtle patrol at Hilton Head and turtle trackers and researching. So um, trying to come up with a solution nice. for the baby sea turtles that get either misorientation or disorientation due to residential light yes. and trying to come up with a, a, a practical screen that can be put around a sea turtle nest to block um, 70% oh, that's of the so light. Cool. So, um, I just sent a prototype off to uh, Amber Kuhn on, uh, earlier this week. She'll get it Friday and she's got to get uh, approval from the Department of Natural Resources. So one of the things that inspired this theme is there is a sea turtle, um, Stumpy, who um, lost a leg to a shark and Amber was able yeah. to help her dig her nest mm. last year. So it's like you know, she was trying to dig a nest. She only had one rear leg and it takes two legs for, but turtles have like two sets of arms, you know, cause th those rear mm -hmm. legs really have a lot of manual dexterity and they shape the whole nest. So yes, Amber managed to help her successfully lay her eggs. Um, so she takes, she'd work with her one flipper and then An Amber would help for, with the, the missing flipper. But then all yeah. of her babies turn toward like, I don't know if it was a hotel or a house that you needed know, the artificial mm. lighting that the was not appropriately yeah. meeting the lighting ordinance code. So all of her babies were lost last year. 
So my my idea was oh, to no. have okay, they're doing a fundraising for a hurricane pet project, but um, I wanted to have the story of you know Stumpy's Stumpy's kids. They're about ready to hatch, and there's lights there. So what can we do to make sure that Stumpy's kids this year make it to the ocean? So um, they're going to yeah. do some problem solving and come up with the you know a couple screen solutions and also uh, a way to map the the local area of the beach to to reach out to the residents to try to get the the lights turned off so it's just that's very very cool and, and they they do some of that already it's just they 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 reach out on saturday nights and when you've got renters there's a new group every every yeah. saturday and you don't necessarily catch With a everybody. turnover you have and to yeah. not everybody's always real mm-hmm. savvy and considerate about dillage yeah world. so anyway so i'm hoping to solve a real problem or provide maybe an additional solution that may or may not work, but hopefully yeah. might help some nest, may be enough to tilt the balance. That's a very cool activity and getting the kids involved so they actually understand about conservation as well, which is very cool. And it's it's a real application yeah. of a, a, a real problem with the real, you know, a few potential solutions. Absolutely. Yeah, very cool. Good luck with Thanks. that. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Okay, so next question. Which childhood book holds the strongest memories for you? Well, so... Choices. <laughs> I would say one of the things I remember the most is um, I was a compulsive reader and I grew up reading Nancy Drew mysteries. So I would get so engrossed in them that you could talk to me and I would not hear you. So, um, I, and I don't... Re- I mean, I'm thinking like third grade maybe second grade so I just remember being huge Nancy Drew mystery fan and feeling like man she's so cool I could never do all the things she does but as other yeah. people said I mean she was a positive female role model that here's somebody taking the initiative that that's making a difference mm-hmm. um, that's right and and I love Jules Verne was another author I loved that was a little bit older and I love the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, although I, it's like, there were whole sections at the beginning It's like, I didn't understand half of those terms. I just had to read them. It's like, (laughs) okay, I'm making my way through. I don't know what half of these things are, but you know, then I would get to the plot. So, um, yes, just, but I just, yeah, I'd say probably Nancy Drew was such one of my earliest favorite, most strong memories. Yeah. And yeah, definitely, as you said, role model, problem solver, and just, yeah, just being... Taking the initiative. I guess confident and brave enough to, yeah, taking the initiative and just looking to see that there's something there that needs to be done and doing it. I may not be as personally brave as Nancy, but I feel like, okay, I (laughs) think I've followed in her footsteps a little bit. I think you have. And especially because in the way that you've you know, as you said, you were brave enough to say, look, I want, I'd like to try something else. I'd like to do something new. And, you know, being brave enough to ask as well. And that's often just the first step. And, you know, yeah, just being able to take those opportunities as they come. So, and what advice would give someone who'd like to do what you do? And what advice should they ignore? So I'd say the, one of the most important things you have to learn is um, how to accept feedback and sometimes to ask Mm. for feedback because how do you know what you don't know and how do you know how you're perceived so one of the things that i loved about png is they had the best performance appraisals of uh, any Mm -hmm. well okay png ge they were just very (laughs) methodical about it they did three relative strengths Mm. and three relative weaknesses and, you know, at GE, they were not so rigorous at acknowledging what your development needs were and being honest and having a good yeah. discussion about it. And the really mm-hmm. sharp um, managers who went far, they would go out and ask for that information. Yes. Um, because you're going to improve more by working on your relative weaknesses than making your greatest strengths stronger. Mm-hmm. And I got a very important piece of feedback when I was working as a a summer engineer. One of the presentations I gave to the plant manager 
I got feedback that it was perceived as being defensive. That wasn't how I was feeling. Mm. I was feeling excited. I was jumping in. I was anticipating the question. I was answering, you know, and so they felt like they were being, yeah. okay, so I really needed, I really needed that feedback and I needed to learn to breathe and to slow down and to repeat the question and to answer and, uh, <laughs> you know, so some of those things, it's like, you have to be willing to learn and, and to not expect to do everything perfectly and to be receptive to feedback. Yeah. Um, and that is not necessarily something that's in a lot of people's comfort zones. It's not necessarily something you learn in high school or at college. No. And just learning, you know, the corporate game of presentation and, and, and sometimes getting really tough feedback. And, and how to respond yeah. to that and how to learn from it and how to move forward. And it's not, um, work is not a solo sport. It is a team sport. So, you know, it's not you being perfect. It's you working with the team and, you know, learning how to, you know, do the roles necessary to make the team successful. Mm, absolutely and yeah and yeah as you were saying it's so important to not just receive the feedback but to give the feedback and you know that's just as nerve-wracking for a lot of people because you know it it can be taken personally or you feel that you don't want to judge them too harshly and yeah it's it's a difficult skill to acquire it is and, and sometimes, I mean, you yeah. got to have a little bit of a thick skin to be able to take it. Mm, you do. But yeah, it's, it's another guest was saying that it's about approaching everything with as little ego or no ego as possible, because it's not necessarily going to be about what you feel about it, but what is needed to achieve the bigger goal. And the other yeah. piece of advice I say, what to ignore is like, at the end of the day, you can look and see what other people advise you to do. And it's like, okay, here's, you know, I, I was at one point told, if you want to go up as fast as possible, you know, jump in the middle of the biggest, hottest problem. So turbine mechanical design. But if that's not the right fit for you, if that's not what success is for you, don't accept somebody else's definition of success. Um, because you may just make yourself miserable trying to make somebody else, you know, to make, Happy. to feel like you're making yeah. your parents feel that you're successful. So you, you've got to look at, it's not just about the title and the money. It's, it's also about um, what you like about the job and what's important to you and how you feel about the, yep. the, the amount of time you spend and the people that you work with. For me, that was hugely important. And so yeah. recognizing that it's not up, nobody else is going to manage your career for you. You have to take the responsibility for that. And you have to be honest with yourself yes. about what's important to you, not, not what you think should be important to you or what people will respect you for you've got to respect yourself first and you other people can't make you happy you're the only person that can make yourself happy exactly and once you learn once you well, once you figure out that that's you know the you know important lessons like it's being taking that next step and going well okay now how do i make that happen and you know having the confidence to say you know i need to know about this or i'd like to you know speak more about that and you know, learning and getting you to where you need to be. It's very cool. Excellent advice. Thanks. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much for speaking with me today, Marsha. It has been absolutely wonderful and amazing learning about all the stuff that you've done in your career as an engineer. All of that is very, very cool stuff to learn and to be able to come up with. The fact that you know, knowing that something that you did is still in use is always such a wonderful feeling because you know, it's, you've contributed and it's, there's a little, not really legacy, but it's continuing to help people and it's continuing to contribute to what other people are doing. And that's just really wonderful. It, it is so cool, especially like when you're doing it at the time, I remember thinking, well, 
you know, is this going to work? Is it going to last? You know, are they kind of coming up with a different design? And when you look at those, all those decades later, it's like, you know, sometimes managers, they, you know, they kind of solve a problem and they move on. And all they've done is they've done yeah. an interim fix and then somebody else has to fix it again. So to really feel that, yeah. okay, I fixed the problem and that solution still works. And, and I got it right. It is, it is a wonderful feeling. And, and I think sometimes people move too quickly and they don't get to see that, you know, the lessons learned really were learned correctly and they really found the right solution. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what happens when you take the time and just, you know, focus on, you know, what will really matter to you. And that's, yeah, it's great. Okay, so thank you again so much. It's been absolutely amazing to speak with you. And if people would like to know more about what you're doing, where can they go? They can go to my website, putneydesigns.com, P-U-T-N-E-Y Designs, which is actually named after um, after my golden retriever, Putney, who was named after a suburb of London <laughs> because my husband's soccer team, uh, excuse me, football team was Tottenham. Tottenham Hotspurs, <laughs> and I wanted to yep. name the dog Chelsea, yes. and he wasn't having any of that because that's a rival football team. So anyway, of course. but Putney of was course. an engineer. <laughs> um, she was a little Houdini. She was really good at solving problems. So, um, so I named nice. I, I named Perfect. my little um, company Putney Designs, and uh, the main character of my book is as a twelve-year-old girl named Putney after Putney. Um, so putneydesigns.com, um, there's a whole, uh, STEM menu where I've got a lot of my STEM experiments there. I've got, um, a projects page where some of Putney has a project in every book. There's a books page, a blog, and then I've got a couple galleries. So I've got a design gallery, things I've designed and created, uh, and a quilt gallery. So things from my monarch quilt to a millennium falcon quilt I designed. Nice. Um, wonderful. Uh, some of the other creative quilts I designed. Um, so you can check out the galleries there. And um, I also linked my podcast on my about page so you can see some of my other podcasts. Nice. This one will be linked there. Excellent. So, um, and then uh, you can also reach out to me there. And I would love to hear from anybody who has ideas for diff different projects or things that you'd like to see. I'm always working on new experiments and uh, I'm a little behind on my video um, blogging, but uh, <laughs> I'm working on book four right now, but I'll be getting back to some of the more experiment videos and uh, additional blogs. So love to hear from Wonderful. anybody who would like to engage with me and STEM ideas or book ideas. Excellent. I'll include all of that in the notes. And yeah, that's amazing. I've been looking at your social media and just all the experiments and the photos you've been taking are just brilliant. And yeah, just such a great idea. Okay. So thank you again. And yeah, I'll look forward to seeing more of the stuff that you're coming out with and next set of books and yeah, have a wonderful evening. You too. <laughs> I really appreciated learning about Marsha's career in engineering and the way that her creative pursuits blend in with her technical background in so many different ways. It's also been wonderful to learn about Marsha's passion for getting kids excited and confident about STEM through her books and activities. To learn more about Marsha and what we discuss in the show or to connect with us, please visit the Steampard website at steampardshow.com. You can also find out more about Marsha and her work on putneydesigns.com and social media, the links for which will be in the show notes. If you enjoyed this conversation, please let me know. Subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, and share this with your geeky or geek curious friends. You can also support Steam Powered on Patreon and Ko-fi under Steam Powered Show, the links of which will also be in the show notes. Thanks for watching.